Okay, so um, again, this is Psych 344, Psychology and Traditional Asian Thought, and this is the first lecture, um, and I'm Professor Kevin Vulcan. And um, we're going to talk a little bit now about uh, psychology and traditional Asian thought. What is traditional Asian thought? And I wanted to give you a little bit of background how I got interested in this stuff. It's a long-winded story, so I'm going to um, shorten it quite a bit. Um, but to give you a little bit of uh, an idea how I got interested in this stuff. And basically, uh, when I was an undergraduate, I was, uh, I was not a psychology major. I was a biologist, a biology major. I love biology. I thought psychology was incredibly flaky. And I thought psychologists, you know, had nothing to do with being a real scientist. I thought it wasn't very scientific. I thought it was pretty flaky. I thought it was an easy major. You know, so you know I just have to do statistics. I have to do calculus. There, I can do statistics. That's easy. Um, and I had lots of kind of misconceptions about uh, psychology. And I didn't take many psychology classes when I was an undergraduate. In fact, I took a sum total of one psychology class, and that was the psychology of death and dying, of all things, right? And what did I learn about in that class? I learned about uh, the, the Holocaust perpetrated by the Nazis, which is also now a class I teach, and I learned about um, how the Tibetan Buddhists uh, view death and the afterlife, which is also part of this class. So. That one class seemed to set into motion uh, some very important things in the rest of my life. And I was exposed in that class to Tibetan Buddhism. And we actually had a Tibetan Buddhist teacher come and speak in the class. And at that time, there were not too many Tibetan Buddhists uh, from Tibet in the United States uh, lecturing or talking. This was way back in the 70s. And uh, uh, they had, the teacher had an individual come to class. And that individual's name was Sogel Rinpoche, who is actually now a very famous Tibetan Buddhist teacher. But at the time, he was quite unknown, and he came to talk to this class of 30 or 40 people and talk to us about um, the idea of the afterlife in Tibetan Buddhism, what it means uh, in Tibetan Buddhism during the dying process and what happens after the dying process. Going on. Something we're going to cover in this class later on, I'm going to talk to you all about that. It's quite fascinating. And that got me a little interested in Tibetan Buddhism. I thought that's really quite fascinating, pretty interesting. And I was doing my biology studies and not taking any psychology. And, but I had to do GE, just like you guys. And I saw there's this class, interesting class on world religions. And I'll sign up for it. And this is a class taught by a guy, Professor Noel King. And uh, the way to describe Professor King is he essentially looked like Gandalf. He had long white hair and a long white beard. And he was a very interesting guy, and his specialty was studying Swahili, of all things. He studied uh, uh, the African language of Swahili, and he was a specialist in this. But he taught this class on world religions. And um, I took this class, and we learned about you know, some Western religions, and we spent a lot of time on Eastern religions. And I became very, very interested in uh, Tibetan Buddhism in that class. I started studying Tibetan Buddhism on my own and uh, was fascinated with it, and especially more about this afterlife, this con conceptions of the afterlife in Tibetan Buddhism. And I did a paper on that for Dr. King, and um, really enjoyed that uh, quite a bit, and um, thought this is a great class, something I'm really interested in, and I'm really starting to become fascinated by Eastern religions. And as a long story short, or as a kind of aside, um, this is also how I got into psychology, because I had no interest in psychology whatsoever, and I was taking doc, uh, Dr. Noel King's class, and I was reading the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which we're going to talk about a little bit later on in the semester. And one day, it was a dark and stormy night, I, I remember it very well, uh, back in the days when, uh, in California, when that stuff used to fall from the sky, you know, that kind of liquidy stuff. Uh, I've forgotten the name of it, but it used to happen quite regularly. There'd be wind and things rolling around. And it was a Saturday night. I was living in the dorms. Um, this was up at UC Santa Cruz where I was an undergraduate, living in the dorms. And um, as this was typical for me back in those days, I had no date. Um, and I had nothing to do. It's a Saturday night. It's storming. Um, everybody I know is out having fun and partying and doing fun things, and I'm by myself. Nothing to do. So I picked up my copy of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which I'd read thoroughly. And... Um, 
started looking through it and said, well, you know, here's this foreword to the Tibetan Book of the Dead. It's written by this guy, Carl Jung. Maybe I should read this. Nothing better to do. And so I sat down, made myself a nice cup of tea, you know, and uh, sat down and uh, opened this foreword, foreword to the Tibetan Book of the Dead, written by a guy who I later found out his name was pronounced Carl Jung. And Jung was a, um, a, a psychiatrist and a follower of Freud. He'd been a follower of Freud, one of Freud's early disciples who had been split off on his own and formed his own system of psychology, which was a little bit broader than Freud's psychology. We're going to talk about that in, in a bit. And I read this, and by the end of reading the foreword, I was absolutely enthralled. It was like the light bulb proverbially went off over my head. And it was like, this stuff is amazing. This Jung guy is amazing. And then from that time until I finished my undergraduate degree, I completed probably about 75 to 80% of the collected works of Carl Jung. I just got really interested in it. I actually ended up having another professor who was a, a poetry professor who was a follower of Jung. I was also a, Christ, a, a, a Trappist, a Catholic Trappist monk. And he became a mentor for me in Union psychology. I took all his classes. I took his class like three times. And um, we did a lot of dream work in that class. It was really amazing. And so I got to actually study a little bit of Union psychology uh, with him. Not in the psychology department, by the way, because there was no class on Jung in the psychology department. There, had, there wasn't then, I think, until even up till now, there's never been a class on Jung in the psychology department. There. Okay. Um, but I became very enthralled with Jung and studied Jung on my own. Jung lived quite a long time. He wrote quite a lot. Um, and I, by the time I graduated, I had read through most of his works, which is a pretty big undertaking. And not to pat myself on the back, but it was a pretty big undertaking. Jung is not easy to read. He's very difficult to read. So this is what I would do on Saturday nights rather than having a date. This is what I would do instead, which says a lot about my social life. But um, it got me interested in psychology. And from that, that's how I got into psychology and eventually led me to become a psychologist. So for me, Asian thought came first. And Asian thought was my gateway drug into becoming a psychologist. And there's a whole more story about that, which I can tell you later. It's probably a two or three beer story. Um, but that's the gist of it. So I became interested in stuff. And I never, I never uh, lost interest in Asian thought at that time. I also continued to study Buddhism. I continued to study Asian religions. And uh, by the time I got to my master's program at Sonoma State, I had, um, I had actually traveled through Asia. So when I graduated um, with my undergrad degree, I went um, well, with my girlfriend at the time and lived in Italy for a while. And um, lived in Italy, and then in, it was Christmas time in Italy, and I don't know if any of you are Italians or you've been to Italy, but around Christmas time, the Italians really start to go crazy. Christmas, you know, starts to become this crazy time of year, and people are doing all this Christmas stuff, and um, you know, it was just, it was getting on my nerves, and so I looked at my girlfriend and said, we've got to get the hell out of here. This is just too much. And she said, where do you want to go? And I go, I don't know, where's good? She goes, you know, I've been to India, it's really cool. I said, okay, let's go to India. So we just bought a plane ticket, hopped on a plane, no plans, had a backpack, went to India, and we spent, um, we spent probably a little over a month just backpacking around. We took trains and buses. Uh, through India, and we ended up going to Nepal for three or four weeks, hanging out in Nepal, which was awesome. I did not want to leave Nepal, by the way. At the end of my time in Nepal, I was going to the American Embassy, and all the Americans was begging for a job because they did not want to come back. Really, if I had literally, if I had got a job in Nepal at that point, I would have never come back. I would was, I was stay here forever. You know, it was awesome. But in, in India and Nepal, I encountered a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about in this class on its native soil. Hinduism of all varieties, uh, Buddhists, many different kinds of Buddhists, especially Tibetan Buddhists in Nepal. I did not have the chance at that time to go to Tibet, which was really quite sad because at that time the border was closed. Uh, the Communist Chinese government had a tight, tight control, tight border uh, thing there, and you could not go to Tibet uh, from that direction. Now you, now you can't. Now you can fly from Nepal into Tibet. You couldn't do that at the time. I think you can. It, it varies. They, they, they let people do it, then they close it down, and they open it up again. But at that time, it was impossible. But I did get to see a lot of Tibetan culture in its native soil. Um, at least uh, there are some Tibetan villages or people who are ethnically Tibetan uh, in Nepal. And I got to see some of those things. I got to experience this stuff firsthand. 
I got um, attacked by a monkey in a Tibetan Buddhist temple. Uh, by the way, if you're traveling in places where there's monkeys, do not uh, grin at monkeys and show your teeth. They consider that a, a form of challenge. And even though they may be little, they are really badass and they will attack you. And so I got attacked by a monkey. And the monk, the young monk who was watching this at the top of the temple, uh, Tibetan Buddhist monk, young guy, was laughing so hard I thought he was going to pee his pants. Um, and somewhere I have a picture of that I should bring in and show you guys. Me staring down the monkey. Um, uh, so I came back from uh, from uh, from my, my my travels in in India and Nepal, and uh, came back to the United States, and um, was sort of still retain this incredible interest in Asian thought, Asian philosophy, and uh, at that time I started back to school, started to study psychology, went to graduate school for psychology at Sonoma State, and for me uh, I was originally going to go back to school to study fish biology. I really wanted to be a fish biologist. And actually, sometimes I think that was the path I should have taken. Uh, fish biology is really fascinating. Uh, fish are really fascinating. Do you guys know what a fish biologist is called? Ichthyologist. Ichthyologist. Excellent. Brownie points for you. Ichthyologist. <laughs> I wanted to be an ichthyologist and work in the fish hatchery. But while I was at Sonoma State in the biology department, I walked over to the psychology department and I like to tell people that I would that they hypnotized me and suddenly I was a psychology major. But what really happened was that I went to the psychology program and um, I saw they had a bunch of classes, not only in psychology, not only in Jungian psychology, but they had classes where they were going to talk about various aspects of Asian thought. The Jungian psycho psychology class where they were going to talk about Tibetan Buddhism, these kind of things. And I thought, man, that is, this is a program that's just made for me. i got to do this, even though it, at the time it had almost zero practical value. Um, but I thought, you know, as Joseph Campbell famously said, uh, you know, he, he told everybody to follow their bliss. So I decided to follow my bliss and sign up for the psychology master's program and learn about this stuff. And I ended up doing a dissertation on Jungian psychology and Tibetan Buddhism. So that's actually what I wrote my... My not dissertation, my thesis on. And uh, so I retained this interest. I was able to combine my interest in psychology and traditional Asian thought, study these things together. And literally, I have not really um, lost my interest in these areas uh, since then. And I'm still very interested in Jungian psychology. I still study Jungian psychology. Uh, over the next three years, I'm going to be working with a Jungian analyst to do a, a very intensive somatic type of dream work. Um, uh, and, and be credentialed in doing this. Um, so I'm still, uh, still quite fascinated by this. Also, later on, though, however, I went on and did a bunch of stuff, which I won't go into, um, and I actually became a clinical psychologist and uh, was in practice. And as a clinical psychologist, I actually uh, became, when I was training for my, doing my clinical training, I became very interested in Freud. So I'm one of these people I went backwards. I became interested in traditional Asian thought, then Jung, and then Freud. And then I found Freudian psychology very useful for clinical practice. And I practiced actually as a Freudian psychologist, not as a Jungian psychologist. I've never really practiced as a clinical psychologist as a Jungian. And in fact, this training program I'm now will be the first time I'm going to train to practice actually as a clinical psychologist as a Jungian. I've never done that. I practiced mostly as a Freudian. I really like Freud. I especially like um, Neo-Freudian theory, object relations theory, and I've actually written a paper on Tibetan Buddhism and object relations theory, and I have actually some more writing I want to do in that area. It's really quite fascinating. It is, I do not see Freud and Jung's thought as separate, that they're two separate schools. They tend to discount and hate each other, um, but since I don't belong to any, any official tribe, I feel uh, free to pull uh, from whatever I like. So uh, that's the nice thing about being an academic psychologist. I don't have to adhere to any sort of institute or anything. I just do whatever I want. So I, I pull freely from Freudian psychology, freely from Jungian psychology, and I think they're both really quite complementary to each other, unlike any Freudian or Jungian you'll ever talk to, um, who are strictly in their camps and like to do stuff. And the bridge for me, uh, one of the bridges for me is traditional, traditional Asian thought. Okay? And I'm going to talk to you in a minute how these things are related. So that was kind of, that's kind of my journey in a little bit of a nutshell. Um, I'm still interested in this stuff. I do a number of traditional Asian practices. I consider myself to be a Tibetan Buddhist. I have a Tibetan Buddhist teacher 
in San Francisco. Um, uh, he's a guy I studied with when I was doing my master's degree at Sonoma State, so I've known him for quite a long time. Um, I've studied traditional uh, Taoist arts for quite a long time. I've been a Tai Chi practitioner since the 1970s, way back in the Jurassic era. Um, I continue to study and practice Chinese martial arts. I uh, have a teacher down in LA I see once a month. Um, I practice uh, karate and I practice traditional Japanese uh, samurai sword drawing, which is an art called the Aido, which is also very meditative and very, very influenced by Zen. And uh, in fact, I really like it. It's better than Zen for me because you get immediate feedback from swinging the sword. And you can sit for years and years and years and never get any feedback on how good you're doing. Uh, when you swing the sword, you get immediate feedback because if you're, if you're in the right posture and you're, you're relaxed and your mind is clear, the sword makes a certain sound. And if you're not, you're tense, you're thinking about something, the sword doesn't make it quite the right sound. And so you get this immediate feedback. So as a behavioral psychologist, I really like that. It's immediate reinforcement, so it's very good. So I do these practices. I've done a number of different kinds of meditation practices over my year, over the years. Uh, for a while, I was very much into practicing yoga. I think there was about four years when I was here that I practiced yoga almost every day. I was really into it. Um, I still really love yoga. I've, I've backed off on the practice a little bit, um, quite a bit actually. I don't do as much as I used to. I really like it. Um, we have really excellent yoga in this county, by the way, if you're into doing yoga, this is a good place to do yoga. Uh, very good yoga teachers here. And I've done a number of other different kinds of things. I could just go on and on and on. <clears throat> my, my interest in traditional Asian thought um, runs uh, pretty deep. Also, I should mention, and I'll talk about this again when we get to the section of Taoism at the end of the semester, uh, a very good friend of mine, I also, for a while, I worked as a dean of a, a traditional Chinese medical school, dean of an acupuncture school. And one of the founders of that school was a Taoist monk. And I became uh, a very close friend of his, and we became very close friends. And I learned a lot about Taoism uh, from my relationship with him. And um, not as his student, but as his friend, which in Taoism is actually some ways is a, a preferable way to teach people, teach your friends by having conversations with them rather than having a sort of traditional guru, chela, student, uh, teacher relationship. And so, uh, you know, I learned quite a bit about Taoism from him. Um, unfortunately, last year he died, which was really a very sad thing, um, but uh, I'm still in touch with his, some of his students and I continue to have conversations with them about Taoism. And I'm now at the point uh, where I'm starting to feel like I know enough about Taoism that at least I could talk to people in the general public about it besides just you guys. And so I'm doing this uh, for the first time doing a workshop with my friend Lauren uh, on September 11th. And so that'll be the first time I've done anything about Taoist philosophy outside of the classroom. But I have been teaching here this class, as I mentioned, for the last 15 years. Um, I do not hold myself out to be an expert on anything I'm going to talk about in this class. So this is the first caveat I'm going to give you, okay? I am not an expert on anything. I'm not a Taoist monk. I'm not a Buddhist monk. I've ne received no ordination. I received no certifications of any kind to do this. Um, I have written some papers on Buddhism and, 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 uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and psychology. I've written a, a master's thesis. I've written a couple papers. That's about it. I have no real uh, authority to tell you this stuff. So again, if you're looking to find a master or a guru who can instruct you in this stuff and knows everything, I am not that person. And in fact, studying this stuff over the years, I've become more and more suspect of people who label themselves masters or gurus in these kind of things. I have a very healthy skepticism of people who uh, label themselves these ways, and unless I'm able to verify that they come from a, an established traditional lineage. And I'll talk to you about lineage a little bit later on. We talk about Zen Buddhism. I'll talk to you a little bit about lineage and how important lineage is. Um, so I have no real credentials. I do have credentials in the martial arts. That I've almost got them incidentally. I think it's because I've been doing them for so long. People have given me certificates saying this person has studied this stuff. You know, I have a couple black belts. I don't know that that means anything other than I've just been doing it for a long time. I don't think I'm that good of a martial artist. I certainly suck as a Tai Chi practitioner, but I just do my best, you know. Um, so that's a caveat, okay, it's a caveat. I have degrees and things like that. Doesn't necessarily mean I know things. So you may find people out there who have different <coughs> views about some of the things we're gonna talk about, okay? So, that, and that's fine. Uh, those views may be 
as valid or more valid than what I'm going to say to you. It's very possible. What I can tell you is I have been studying this stuff for a long time. I hope that my study has been sincere. I will do my best to try not to mislead you. Um, uh, hopefully I won't. Hopefully my, my knowledge is not erroneous. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Uh, I will tell you that I think Hinduism is the thing I know the least. It is um, a vast, interesting, diverse uh, philosophy and religion. Um, I feel like I'm still just at the very beginning learning stages of Hinduism. I feel like Tibetan Buddhism I know uh, perhaps more because I actually have a Tibetan Buddhist teacher and if I don't know something I can ask him a question about it and I've done that over the years. So I feel like I know more about that. And I feel about um, uh, Zen, I know a little bit about Zen, I've done a little bit of Zen practice. I like uh, Zen quite a lot, Zen Chan, the same kind of Buddhism. I like Zen and Chan a lot. Um, there's a lot of similarities to Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, there's also a lot of similarities to, um, to Taoism. And I feel as Taoism, you know, I've, I've had this wonderful, rare experience of having a friend who was a, a real true uh, Taoist monk from a really original type of Taoism. And I feel because of that, I have a little bit of knowledge in that. And I also have maybe a, a little bit more knowledge of actual Taoist practice. Um, I was, a, as I mentioned, a dean of a Chinese medicine school, which basically meant I was a human pincushion. And uh, we'd go in and get needles, <laughs> I mean, the students needed somebody to practice on, so they'd stick needles in me, which sometimes actually was really quite painful. Uh, but I learned quite a bit about Chinese medicine, uh, you know, in that milieu. And um, I know something about Chinese martial arts, and I know a little bit about Taoist meditation and these sorts of things. I know a little bit about Qigong, which are Taoist um, uh, movement, health arts. So I know a little bit about that sort of stuff. But that's about it. So again, not an expert in anything. So, with that said, uh, let's talk a little bit about what is traditional Asian thought. I use this phrase, traditional Asian thought, because it can include ideas uh, of religion, philosophy, and uh, uh, psychology. And in fact, much of what traditional Asian thought is would really be considered by Westerners to be a form of psychology. This is more true for some, uh, some of these systems than others. For instance, in Buddhism, it is absolutely true. You could almost think of Buddhism more as a system of psychology than it is a religion, and that would be perfectly okay. But we'll find some psychology in Hinduism, we'll find some in Taoism, we'll find some in Zen. Uh, it's all over the place. Now, why do I say, and why do I call this class traditional? Okay, This is to make a distinct difference between the study of traditional systems as those that have as compared to those that are more modern. Okay, the modern systems have been more recently amalgamated, they've been westernized, they've been demythologized, de-shadowized. Right? This is something that uh, the American psychologist James Hillman said, a lot of this Eastern stuff comes to America, and I'll quote, smelling only of sandalwood and not of crap. He didn't say crap, he said shit. But um, so not smelling the sandalwood, but smell, you know, they come here, they smell really nice, but we've left out the shadow side of things, the dark part, the, 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 the difficult emotional things to deal with. Right? We only want to look at the good things. And um, you, you see this, a good example would be yoga. If you see, look at yoga practice. Yoga practice in this country generally accentuates the positive and doesn't bring in all the sort of, uh, uh, you know, the dark art parts of, of yoga. Right? Dealing with negative emotions as much. It just focuses on the positive. And this is really typical for lots of, of systems that have come over to the West from the East. Uh, but to really understand these systems, we really need to engage not only the positive uh, side of, of these systems that are in the light, but also the shadow side that are in the dark. How they deal with negative emotions, how they deal with negative mental states. These kind of things are also very, very important. And you don't really get the full thing unless you, you have that stuff. So to get that, you really got to go back to the tradition. Also, we want to be able to, as much as possible, tease out Western ideas from our Asian philosophy. Because then we, if we understand purely what is traditional, then later on we can always compare it or add the Western stuff to it. But you'll never really know what the original stuff was if, you, if it's all mixed in with Western stuff. So what we're trying to do in this class, what I'm trying to do is to give you uh, as much as possible, as much as I'm able to do, a sense of the traditional arts, where, where they really, what they really are originally, the original systems, not the stuff that's been westernized and 
transmuted. And I'll talk a little bit, especially when I talk about Buddhism, I'll talk about how Buddhism is adapted to the West. You'll see the traditional stuff, and hopefully by the end of my talk on Buddhism, I'll talk to you a little bit about how it's, it's how it has changed and become westernized, and, and, and so you'll be able to see a little bit how it's, how it's progressed. But you, you need to know the traditional stuff first, in my opinion. So we're going to talk about that. Okay? I'm also not going to include in the class a lot of syncretic religions, religions that are combinations of things. For instance, something like uh, Sikhism, which may have some aspects of Islam and may have some aspects of Hinduism sort of mixed together. Uh, Baha'i faith, for instance, another one from India that we're not going to talk about, which takes a bunch of different sources and sort of brings them together, and is more modern. Again, we're going to stick back to traditional things. One, one traditional religion, uh, Asian uh, religion, that I'm not going to talk about really at all is Jainism. Jainism is another uh, a reform of Hinduism that happened. Buddhism is also a reform of Hinduism, and Jainism is another one. Um, I don't talk about Jainism mostly just because I don't have time. Uh, I don't have a lot of knowledge about it. I don't have time uh, in the class to really fit it in. So that's the one that we're going to be missing out on. There's not a lot of people who practice it uh, nowadays. There's a few people. I mean, it includes a lot of Hindu ideas. It includes some ideas uh, that are very similar to Buddhism. Um, and it's, but we're not going to go into that. And that's the one sort of omission in this class. If you've taken another class as a world religion, you may have covered this stuff. And part of it is because I want to cover some of the other things a little more deeply. So that's just my choice. It's not any 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 uh, hit on Jainism. It's a perfectly fine religion. Um, again, if you're a Jain or you're a follower of Jainism, I apologize in advance. Uh, but we won't really get into that. So let's talk about generalities. Generally, I don't. Generally, I don't like to talk about generalities. Right. Um, uh, you always open yourself up for a problem when you when you generalize about things. I much prefer specifics and exact information, but in the spirit of traditional Asian thought, <coughs> we will take a holistic view of everything, and, and to do that, we will make some generalisms. The first one is exactly what I just said, that Asian thought tends to be more holistic as opposed to reductionist. Okay? There are many exceptions to this. Buddhism has some very notable exceptions to this. There's the aspect of Buddhism is almost like behavioral psychology where you have chains of events that you add together and you start from like little reducted things and you add them together. Um, but for the most part, if we want to generalize, we can say traditional Asian thought tends to be a little bit more holistic in its viewpoint than uh, Western philosophy, Western religions. Okay. There's a focus on interconnectedness. There's a top-down view of uh, reality, of the universe of reality. Traditional Asian thought speaks of an underlying reality of the universe which cannot be directly approached but must be intuited or experienced or acknowledged. Okay? So this is a very important theme that there's this underlying, maybe more true reality or underlying hidden uh, reality which is, sort of encompasses everything in a holistic way. Okay? And you'll find this in most of the traditions in Asian thought. Asian thought tends to be nonlinear. Our reality as Americans tends to be molded after a 19th century assembly line, right? Or even a 20th century assembly line. You think how uh, Ford first made cars, right? And he introduced the assembly line for manufacturing cars. You got a little piece, you add it, it goes down the line, you add another piece, you go down the line, you add another one. We tend to live our lives in this assembly line sort of manner, right? You're born, your parents give you some influences, right? You go through a developmental stage, you go here, you get more stuff. Go through here, you go here, you become an adult here, you do certain things here, blah, 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 at the end you die. You're done, right? Nice linear, linear thing, right? Asian thought really does not uh, think this way. If you look at, like, say, an individual's life, it may appear to be linear, but it's just like if you were on the surface of the earth, right? If I walk from over here, I walk over to the bell tower, you would say I'm walking in a straight line, right? Straight line here in the bell tower, go straight over there, boom, right? But really, if you actually step back and you looked at the curvature of the earth, you would see that when I'm walking to the bell tower from here, I'm actually walking on a curve. It's a very slight curve. But if you look at the big picture, you get the holistic picture, you'll see that I'm actually walking around the globe, right? The first leg of the journey is to walk over to the bell tower. But if I kept walking, I'd eventually come back around here, right? We all know that now, the world's round. 
All right, hopefully there's no flat earth people in the class here. Uh, we're pretty sure. What was, was the rapper that was the flat earth guy recently? It was a rapper who came out as a flat earth guy. It was amazing. Um, <laughs> let me dispel you of that. We have pictures from space. Uh, we have other ways we can prove the world is round. Uh, it's pretty easy. You just walk out to the out, out to the out to the ocean here, and I, you can't really see Hawaii or Japan, <laughs> even with a telescope. Right? If you had a really powerful telescope and you stood on the shore out here and you look for Hawaii and Japan, you won't see them. Why? Because they're over the curvature of the Earth. Right? It's a very easy way to prove it to yourself. You don't believe it. Same thing. I'm walking over the bell tower. There's still a little bit of curve there. Right? So when we look at an individual's life, things may appear to be linear, but from a traditional Asian thought standpoint, that's just because we don't see the full arc of the curve. Right? And there's lots of nonlinearity things going on here, especially conceptions of time. And uh, past, the differences between past, present, and future are less distinct. Time is seen as existing in vast ages, which in Hinduism are called yugas. And these have certain characteristics. Also, uh, the way our lives, the way that we exist, uh, you know, both life and afterlife. Um, many of these tradition, Asian, Asian uh, traditions have uh, include the concept of reincarnation. That after you die, you are recycled back into a new body. Your soul or some entity is recycled back into your body and you're reborn again. And so you live in this sort of cyclical manner. It's often represented as a wheel. So we'll talk more about this. And hopefully by the end of this class, you'll understand a little bit of the distinctions between you know, how, for instance, Hindus view reincarnation and how Buddhists view reincarnation. Okay? They're very different, but well, subtly different. Okay? We'll get to that. So this nonlinearity, very important. Multidimensional. There's a lot of what Freud called, Freud coined this term, condensation. Condensation is where one symbol may hold many different meanings. Okay? And for traditional Asian thought, existence is complex and colorful. And um, this allows a lot of tolerance of seeming inconsistencies of opposite points of view able to exist within the same system. And there's no better example of this than Hinduism. Literally, there are Hindus who are atheists, and there are Hindus who are pantheists, believe in many gods, and there are Hindus who are monotheists, who believe in one god. And they're all equally Hindu, perfectly OK and hold those inconsistencies within the framework of this system. Yes? But isn't, sorry, I'm quoting something, but isn't it in the Hindu thought that it's, that if you believe in many gods, but you're the same as the, as you say, Krishna, but if you believe in the false gods, it's not in the Krishna, that it's not Krishna, you're going into your path of enlightenment. Some Hindus may believe that, and then some do not. Okay. Okay. There are many, there's about as many different kinds of Hinduism as there are thoughts you could have about Hinduism. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of different kinds of Hindus. And some, there are some main branches that have some, there's some mainstream beliefs. We're going to talk about those. And then there's some ones that are a little bit more branched out. And you can look at gods and deities and Hindus as real gods and deities, supernatural beings. You can see them as immoral. You can see them as being subject to the laws of karma. Or you can see them as certain types of mental energy. And those are all valid points of view. Yes? So what would be the commonalities for Hindus to have in order to be able to call themselves we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. Yeah, there's a whole list of things that generalize. Not, okay. but they're, they're, again, they're a generalization. Mm -hmm. They're not written in stone anywhere. There isn't a Hindu pope who says, this is what it means to be Hindu, right? Um, and there's also now in India, interestingly enough, and if somebody reminds me, I can talk more, more about this later, there's now been a Hindu nationalism movement in India. And so there are Hindus now that have, have turned Hinduism not just into a religion, but also into a political nationalist movement. That being Hindu means being Indian. And being Indian means you should be Hindu. And that becomes really important for them. So it, that's a relatively newer wrinkle on the whole thing. It also has a political identity now, which is very interesting. And they believe all sorts of things. For instance, the idea that you don't eat meat in Hinduism is relatively new. Hindus back in the day used to eat all sorts of stuff, including meat. And they used to sacrifice animals and do all sorts of stuff. They don't do that. And part of that has been adopted by the Hindu national movement. This is what it means to be a Hindu. You don't eat meat, right? But I can tell you from personal experience, because I was in Nepal, and I went to a Kali temple in Nepal up in the mountains, way away from anybody, and they were having a big festival. And I walked into the temple, and 
There were Brahmin priests chanting and chanting mantras and, and chanting. And there was another Brahmin priest with a curved, very sharp knife, took the head of a goat, killed the goat very, very skillfully, by the way, without, uh, without any sort of suffering, killed the goat, blood spurting all over the place. And the goat is given to another set of people over there. They carve it up. There's a bunch of women over there cooking. And there's delicious goat stew being literally, there's like a just, you know, line. Goats killed, sacrificed, goes off, goes into the, into the pot for very delicious goat stew. There. It was quite good. <laughs> the blood all over the place. Moms are taking their little babies and little toddlers, holding them, dipping their hands in the blood and then taking the kids to the Kali statue and having them put the blood on the statue with, with their hands. And that's a sign of, that's an auspicious thing to do, to worship Kali. That, my friends, was a Hindu temple. There was killing going on, and there was meat eating going on. Okay? Those things, if you ask anybody mainstream Hindu, those things are both forbidden in Hinduism. Right? But there it was. I was there. I saw it. I was experiencing it my first hand. Is it perhaps like divided now? Kind of like the old traditional Hindu beliefs? Well, that was an old traditional Hindu belief. You know, I mean, yeah. And then the interesting thing about that is then you, then you walk from that, that's the Kali temple was down below. You walk up and up further on the side of the mountain was a Parvati temple who was the, who was the, who was the, uh, the peaceful nation, right? And in that temple, everything was vegetarian. There was no animal sacrifices allowed. Everybody was vegetarian. You came in, they put a nice dot on your forehead, you hung out, it was all mellow, all peaceful, there was no blood anywhere. And so right there in the same, next to each other, you had these two examples of Hinduism. And, you know, well, I was freaked out because I, I studied a little Hinduism. Hindus are sacrificing goats? I've never heard of this before, but there it was. So again, you can find all sorts of different aspects of Hindu. Note that's an extreme one, but you know, it, it, that kind of stuff does exist. Yes? Is it all based off of the individual then, and what their beliefs are, and what they feel is okay? Yes and no. I'm going to weasel out of that one. Hold on to that till we talk about Hinduism. Because we'll, we can get into that a little bit more. We'll talk a little more about that. Yes? Uh, could that be seen as like an appreciation for the animal world? Or? Maybe, maybe. We'll talk about that. It's not typical. You don't find a lot of Hindus sacrificing animals. Not, not, not in the modern day. If you went back, you know, 300 years, 400 years, you'd probably see more of that. We don't see it much now. We'll talk a little about that. Okay, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about what it means to do these things that are not typical of Hinduism. There is, there is a left-handed path. We'll talk a little bit about that when we get to Hinduism and Buddhism. Okay. Talk about tantric Buddhism and tantric Hinduism. We'll talk about that. So hold on to those questions. Great questions, by the way. Excellent. Okay. So lots of tolerance of seeming inconsistent points of view. Okay. Lots of things symbolizing one symbol meaning having lots of different meanings. Okay. This idea of condensation very important. You see this a lot. Uh, reform movements. Well, we have reform movements in Western religions too. Um, it's not uh, just in Eastern religions. I mean, you guys know about reform movements in Western religions. Many of you practice probably reform religion. Uh, I assume many of you are probably uh, Christian or were brought up Christian. Well, Christianity is, a, in essence, to some degree, a reform religion. It's a reform of Judaism, right? Remember Jesus was a Jew? You know, he kind of broke with the tradition, kind of changed things around a little bit, and so reformed uh, what was a, uh, uh, you know, what was, uh, we now call it, you know, Jewish practice. And then you have Islam coming along, and you have Muhammad essentially reforming, to some degree, Christianity and Judaism, right? So you, you can see these, you know, even in, even in the West, these monotheistic religions are kind of related to one another, kind of reformed one another. Right? Well, we see this in Asia, too. And you can see this, especially in Hinduism and Buddhism, that uh, Hindu, Hinduism um, exists for a long time. The Buddha actually takes Buddha is born as a Hindu, lives in a Hindu place, and he, be, he essentially reforms uh, Hinduism, throws out some long-term Hindu ideas and concepts, and um, brings in some new ones. In fact, a Hindu scholar once told me 
that the idea of ahimsa, we've been talking about this, ahimsa means non-injury to beings, uh, that this idea actually was, wasn't really existing in, in Hinduism until Buddhism came along. And after the Buddhists said, yeah, we're not going to injure beings, the Hindus said, well, maybe we better be a little more peaceful too. And so they adopted ahimsa. At least that was one story that Hindu scholar told me. I don't know how true it is, but it's an interesting idea. And so you have reform movements. So Buddhism reforms Hinduism, and then even within Buddhism you have a number of reforms. Right? So Buddhism changes throughout the years, and there are reforms within Buddhism. Right? And you can see a little bit of this in Taoism as well. Um, so we have these reform movements. Wasn't, wasn't Buddhism, or the Buddha himself, folded into Hinduism at the, the time? The Hindus later said, well, we're just going to consider the Buddha to be the, uh, uh, an avatar of Vishnu. So yes, theoretically, if, you're, if, if you want to call yourself, if you're a Buddhist and you want to call yourself a Hindu, you can say, well, I just worship uh, this avatar, of, I think it's the ninth or the tenth avatar of Vishnu. I just worship this, this avatar of Vishnu, so you know, he's my main focus for meditation. So that's what I do, so I consider myself to be Hindu. Nobody can tell you that you're not. That's fine. So Hinduism, again, very inclusive, very inclusive. And some Hindus, you might talk to some Hindus, and you say, oh, I'm a Buddhist. They go, oh, I see, you just like the avatar of Vishnu, so you're just basically Hindu, right? And others will say, no, no, you're, you've reformed, you're, you've gone away from real Hinduism, so you're not Hindu anymore. Hindu nationalists would probably tell you that. They're not going to consider you as a Buddhist to be Hindu. I mean, I, that would be my guess, right? We'll talk more about that. Rough breakdown, very rough. Cosmic wholeness. Really see that, um, that's represented very well by Hinduism. The natural world with the big in, represented by Taoism. We're going to talk more about that. The social world, applying these spiritual principles to human society, that we're going to see in Confucianism, which is the flip side of Taoism. We're going to get to that. And, um, and so when we talk in this class about Taoism, you can really think about Taoism slash Confucianism. The way I teach about Taoism is I see that Confucianism is the application of Taoist principles to human society. Not all Taoist scholars or Confucian scholars will agree with that. But that's what I, how I was taught about this. And I think I, I've convinced myself that that's really the case. Okay? So when I talk about Taoism in this class, you can also include Confucianism in that. Okay? And then psychological Buddhism. Buddhism is really represents at its core, uh, very psychological ideas, really is kind of a psychological system, because in Buddhism, everything emanates from the mind. Okay? So this is a rough way to think about these different systems. I show you a map here. I hope to show you lots more maps. Let's talk about the places that we're talking about. India, China, Japan, Tibet up here, even down here into the uh, Thai Peninsula, down in Syria, Vietnam, Korea a little bit. We'll talk a little bit about these places. Not too much. Mostly, mostly India, China, and Japan. Okay, but we'll peripherally mention the other places as well. So it's a little like the elephant metaphor. You guys know the elephant and the blind uh, men describing the elephant. One guy says, well, it's this long thing here. And the other guy, no, it's this hard, pointy thing. The other guy, it's, no, it's like a tree trunk. And the other guy who's over here at the end, he gets the maybe they're not the greatest idea job of describing things. And so any one of these guys' descriptions is not going to tell you really what the elephant is like. But if you take all the descriptions together, then you may get, start to get a sense of what the elephant's like. And this class is a little bit like these blind men and the elephant. That I hope to give you lots of different perspectives in this class, talk about different systems, and at the end, my hope is you'll have a sense of what traditional Asian thought is, kind of a holistic sense. Okay. Um, but it really will take all the descriptions that we're going to have to help you get that sense. The other thing in traditional Asian thought is a sort of self as an individual versus a group identity. Traditional Asian thought tends to be less individualistic uh, than Western thought. It tends to have a little bit more of the, the group. Put a little bit of the group first and the individual second. This is true for the most part in general, but not in the specifics, because we will also see uh, systems where the individual really becomes really important, and individual effort is really really the most important thing, especially when we talk about Buddhism. Okay? The Buddhists tend to be a little bit more individualistic, which is one of the reasons, by the way, that Buddhism has uh, flourished in the United States, and has become really popular here, because again, it's the pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of mentality. As Americans, we like that. 
You know, I work hard, I do my own hard work, and I reap the benefit from that. So we like that as Americans. So Buddhism makes it easy for Americans to sort of get into it because it's that individual, individualistic idea. But there is also more of a collectivist idea in Buddhism. There's a couple things in Buddhism that are really where the group, where other people, the group as a whole, really are more important than the individual. We'll talk a little bit about that and then bring in the idea of compassion in Buddhism. So it, it, it's a little hidden. There is a lot of this individual effort stuff that Americans seem to focus on, but there's also sort of a lot of collective thought in Buddhism as well. So we'll talk about that. Okay. There's less separation between self and experience. Life is not as experienced as a video game. It's not this Descartesian motion of sort of like, I think, therefore I am. I'm a head on a stick, right? I experience things from a distance. In Asian thought, we are much more, the body and the mind are much more tied together. We experience things intellectually and, and physically and, sens and with sensations and other ways integrated together. Okay? And because of this, we, we have traditional Asian thought is much more of a tie to the natural world. And the worldview is, is, is very closely derived from agricultural myths, cyclical time, rebirth, these kinds of things. We used to have this in the West too. But since the time of Descartes, those things have been removed. Philosophy and religion have separated. Um, science and religion have separated. Um, thought, rational thought, and feelings have separated. Um, and so we don't have this in, in Asian thought. Okay, in Asian thought, these things are still very in, much integrated. Okay, and this is, a, this is kind of a neat thing. And what you, what you see is that, um, that we also um, have this in the West in systems of psychology. And this is one of the reasons why I like to use depth psychology, Freud psychology, Jung psychology. Because in Freudian and Jungian psychology, we also are integrating the intellectual, the philosophical, with the experiential. In other words, you can't just read Freud and analyze yourself. You actually have to go and do the actual work where you experience that relationship with the analyst in order to affect the psychological change, right? So that, in that way, it's very similar to Asian thought. Freudian psychology, Jungian psychology, very similar to Asian thought. The mind and body are not separate. The thoughts and the emotions are not separate things. They're integrated. Okay, so this is also where these kinds of psychologies really dovetail very nicely with traditional Asian thought. There's also transcendence, that many Asian systems uh, have an idea of transcendence. In, in Hinduism, this is moksha. In Buddhism, it's nirvana. And that's sort of the, the, the real world is to some degree illusory. Okay, and Buddhists call this maya, right? It's illusory. By seeing through the illusory nature of the world, one is able to transcend to a new, better plane of existence. And there's a lot of many different techniques, mostly meditational techniques, for achieving this. Okay. But again, there's also this idea of cyclical stuff. You can transcend, but then you return to the world, and you transcend again, you return to the world. We see this uh, very specifically in Zen Buddhism. If you ever look at these Zen ox herding pictures, that's exactly what they're describing. Achieving transcendence enlightenment, but then bringing it back into the world. And so what you find is in certain countries like India, they tend to be very transcendent. We're going to get away from the world. We're going to get away from samsara. We're going to get away from the cycle of existence. Okay? But when you get to China, because the native Chinese religions, you know, the native Chinese religions like Taoism, the appropriate place for a human is between heaven and earth. So if you go to heaven, then you're at some point you're going to return back to earth. And then you go to heaven, you return back to earth. So once we get to China, we see a little bit more like uh, the transcendence gets, um, gets the sort of rough edges taken off. And we start having a little bit more of this like idea of where it's appropriate to be a human being. And this is the influence of Taoism. And, Taoism, and we're going to talk about this later, Taoism influences Buddhism uh, to a great degree, and uh, we're going to see that. But there is this idea of transcendence. And that's something, too, that you, you also see this in Western religions, right? You know, Christians, you're going to die, and you're going to transcend and go to heaven, right? That's also, we find these in Western religions, more or less degree. But, in, but, um, in, in, but you have more of this idea, though, that there's this, there's this sort of coexisting, more, more real, better reality uh, you know, that coexists with our sort of uh, illusory con uh, consensus reality that we have. All right, meditation. Most of these traditional Asian thought uh, systems have some type of meditation. Okay, and there's lots of different types. It can be just quietly sitting. It can involve uh, solitude, silence. It can involve 
chanting mantras. It can involve certain types of movement. It can involve certain types of yoga, um, certain visualizations, uh, looking at certain things, lots of different postures. These go from the extreme to the mild, and the mild to the extreme. So I'm going to tell you about some of the mild ones. I'm going to show you some very extreme ones in this class. That should be something that most of you probably will have not have seen or heard about before. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Lots of different types of meditation. If you're going to practice a system of traditional Asian thought, you are probably going to practice some kind of meditation, whether it's sitting in a posture, doing some sort of martial arts, chanting mantras, doing something, taking a pilgrimage. Um, there's some sort of form of meditation practice. Okay, this is very, very true. Now, we have meditation practices in Western religions too, but we've seen over time that these have declined in popularity. For instance, back in the day, Christians, uh, you know, monks would, you know, basically um, you know, meditate and pray all the time. Uh, lay practitioners would probably pray a lot more now. It's, it's, you don't see it as much. It's not emphasized as much. But in traditional Asian thought, this has um, been an emphasis. And I would say there's probably some decline now in traditional Asian thought of meditation as, as uh, Asia uh, becomes more westernized. For instance, if you study Japanese Buddhism, many Japanese Buddhist churches now do not really, people don't really meditate. They just go to church on Sunday and they chant some hymns and then they go home and, and they try to do good deeds and follow the religion, but they don't meditate as much. And you see those are relatively newer versions of Buddhism. So we see some little bit, of, and I think it kind of corresponds with the westernization of some of these countries. But traditionally, there's always some kind of meditation. There's a reliance on stories, fables, and myths. Again, lots of condensation. Uh, there's nonlinear thinking uh, in this. And this is great, especially when you have a population that traditionally was largely illiterate. You have people, you know, only, only like, for instance, in, in ancient India, only really the Brahmins and the merchant class would actually learn to read and write. And so everybody else, you wanted to tell them about the religion, you had to show it in a, tell it in a story or show it in a visual way, some way that people would understand what's going on. And so you, you have lots of myths and fables and parables and things like this. Again, I mentioned before the difference in religion and philosophy, not so strong as they are in the West. Intellect, faith, and devotion go together. They're not separated as in the West. And uh, traditional Asian thought can be faith-based or it can be scientific. There really is not this big distinction between the two things. Why are Westerners interested in traditional Asian thought? And this has become a very interesting thing. I'm really quite fascinated by this. Is that you find in the, that really, it's not really until around the 1800s or so that, um, that people in the West really start to become interested in a sort of serious way and in, in larger numbers with Asian philosophy, Asian religions. People knew about it before then. People had traveled to Asia. You have Jesuits in the 1500s traveling to all sorts of places in Asia. They end up going to Japan. Uh, Jesuits, sort of the uh, sort of one of the intellectual branches of the Catholic Church, and the Jesuits, um, you know, when they go places, they're very interested in translating stuff. They're very interested in look at um, some of these traditional philosophies and things like that. But it doesn't really become something that mainstream people really know a lot about until the 1800s. In the 1800s, you have uh, Europeans who are, who are translating, um, starting to translate uh, texts from traditional Asian thought. You have uh, uh, ideas, things like Buddhism, starting to have an influence on, on some thinkers. And so this starts to get people interested in this stuff. And again, one way you can think about this, and some people have talked about this, is that as, uh, as we industrialize in the West, people start to feel like they're losing something. That something they had maybe in their church where they had more direct experience with sort of like the mystical uh, feelings that religious can bring. Those, some of these things start to become lost. And by the 1800s and definitely starting in the 1900s, people are trying to regain this some way. They don't get it in Western religions as much. And so they learn about these Eastern religions and realize this is the way they can have a direct contact with that mystical experience. And so this may be why these things become, start to become popular. And again, you also have these, you know, modernization that alienates people. You have these wars that alienate people, world wars. And after this, people start looking for, for some sort of more uh, direct spiritual experience than maybe what they're finding in their, in, their, in their traditional Western religions. And by the 1950s, things like Zen Buddhism start to become popular in the United States. This is a picture of Alan Watts, who in the... 50s and 60s was a Westerner who was actually trained in Western religions, 
who became very interested in Eastern religions, especially in Zen Buddhism, and he started to lecture about these. He actually uh, ended up living in Sausalito up in the San Francisco Bay in a houseboat, um, and he would lecture. He did all sorts of talks about uh, Asian religion, very brilliant, talking about uh, differences and similarities between Eastern and Western thought. And again, there's some, uh, some of his talks I have up on the website for you guys if you want to check it out. And, but I think, you know, and then by the time you get to the 60s when you have young people really questioning uh, the sort of traditional Western ways of doing things, including Western religions, you see a real huge popularity in Asian religions. And a lot of Asian teachers come to the United States, especially from places like Tibet, where Tibetans have been driven out of Tibet, uh, religious people have been driven out of Tibet by the Chinese invasion, and there's a Tibetan diaspora. Tibetans go to Europe, they end up coming here, and you have very highly qualified uh, teachers coming to the United States and coming to Europe and starting to teach these things and opening these teachings up, genuine teachings up for uh, Westerners. And you also see this is the case with Hinduism. You have people like the Beatles, you know, the most popular rock band ever in the world. They go to India, they have a guru, they become interested in Hinduism, and then, and then because they're interested in it, lots of Westerners become interested in it. And so you have Hindu teachers coming to the United States, coming to Europe, and so again, you see the blossoming of this thing, and they bring along things like yoga, that becomes popular, and so you see a lot of popularity of these things now. You have people coming from China, of course, from California. We get a lot of this because we're on the Pacific Rim, and so we have a lot of Asian people here, a lot of Chinese people, a lot of Japanese people, and so they bring their culture with them. And part of their culture includes traditional Asian thought, and those people are here, and then those teachings, those practices become available to Westerners, and then we start to adopt those things. And that's what we're seeing now.